I'm Kirsty Haynes. I'm the Principal Advisor for Learning Disability and Autistic People in Partners in Care and Health. I'm now going to introduce you to some really amazing speakers today. We've got a nice blend of national policy, some research insight, some really a really lovely practical example of working together on the ground to make things change and a challenge to local government as an employer as well about some of the things it can do. First of all, I'm going to introduce you to Michelle and Rebecca from Autistica, who are going to talk us through their most recent project. Thanks so much. Um, yeah, if you move on to the first slide. So hi, I'm I'm Rebecca. I'm Director of External Affairs at Autistica. And um, today I've also got Michelle um, from our research team um, joining me. So I'll first be talking a bit about Autistica. And um, for those of you that don't know who we are, I know some of you do. Um, and talking about our work more broadly on um, neurodiversity and um, some of the recent um, projects we've been working on. Um, and then Michelle's going to be talking more specifically around um, our Neurodiversity Employers Index, um, which is due to be released next year. So next slide. So Autistica is the UK's leading autism research and campaigning charity. Um, and we're all about enabling autistic people to live happier, healthier, longer lives. Um, and we know that a big part of that is about um, being in um, fulfilling employment for many autistic people, um, which is why that has become quite a big focus for us. Um, so what do we do? Well, we um, shape and we grow research across the UK um, and we fund um, research, but also do research in-house at Autistica. Um, and then we turn that research into um, practical change. So, you know, advising policy um, and also turning that into um, tools, resources and information. Move over to the next slide. So we've set um, a um, series of six rather ambitious um, goals to achieve by 2030. And you can see highlighted there is our goal around employment. So by 2030, the employment rate for autistic people will double. Um, so we set that goal when the employment rate was two in 10 autistic people in employment, um, although that's sort of recently changed to three in 10. Um, that's where we're kind of um, aiming to, to double. Um, but you can see from these other goals that all of these are pretty um, essential and complement um, our goal around employment. You know, we know that autistic people need to be happy and healthy in order to be um, able to work. Um, we also know that attitudes are one of the biggest barriers to autistic people um, getting in work, staying in work and, and progressing in employment. So all of these goals are very much interlinked. Um, we've published um, strategies under each of these goals with um, a number of projects that we are funding um, and are going to be carrying out ourselves, but also um, recommendations um, for government um, in each of these areas. <clears throat> and um, our employment plan um, covers um, what we're going to be talking, some of the things we're going to be talking about today, including the Neurodiversity um, Employers Index, but also um, some projects around um, building career support profiles for autistic people um, and employment readiness programmes. So you can go onto our website and have a look um, at our employment plan if you want to know some of the um, detail of some of these other projects that we're working on. Um, but we're just kind of focusing on those that we're currently um, kickstarting this year. Next slide, please. So our work on employment um, really started, well, we, we knew it was a, a community priority and all of the work that we do at Autistica is based around um, priorities for the autistic community. Um, but we also um, started a corporate partnership with um, Deutsche Bank um, and they were really interested in doing quite a lot of work on neurodiversity, but specifically wanted um, to run an internship scheme for autistic graduates. So we started at that point a partnership with um, University College London um, to carry out research and also to develop um, an evidence based internship program for the bank and for them to sort of roll out across um, banks um, across the globe. Um, and this is quite a nice quote, I think. Sometimes you just need someone to take a chance on you. Um, and um, yeah, that was from one of the interns at, on the scheme. Next slide. So the work that we did with UCL was um, carried out through the Diverse Mind Survey. This is an online survey open to autistic people, non-autistic people, um, uh, employees, but also managers and HR to importantly get sort of a 360 view of what's going on. Um, and, and potentially um, what could change um, for the better. 
So we focused on all of these areas that are in that box, um, that purple box there, um, and also asked for potential future areas of research. Um, and one of those areas um, was career progression. And um, we've since been gathering more information on that too. Um, and as I say, obviously multiple um, internships are run with Autistica and Deutsche Bank and, and quite a lot of information was gathered from that. I haven't included um, all of the findings from the Diverse Minds survey here, but um, it's all available online if you want to um, go onto UCL's website. Um, they've kind of gathered together all of the data, but um, more is coming out all of the time. Um, it's a huge data set, so um, lots is it's coming out um, over the next sort of year or so. Um, but if we move on to the next slide. Some of that um, information we've turned into um, a practical resource for um, HR um, and um, senior managers. Um, and that includes, um, that's our employer's guide, guide to neurodiversity. It's a free guide available on our website. Um, you basically just need to register um, to access it. Um, and as a result of registering, you can register for ongoing updates um, on the latest research that's coming out of UCL and elsewhere. Um, and any other sort of um, initiatives, resources and events as well. But um, initially the guide includes um, how to run um, inclusive interviews, um, workplace adjustments, so how to make your workplace more accessible um, and how you can talk about autism at work because we know we've had feedback from companies that that's um, something they really struggle with. It's how to have those conversations and how to kind of broach the subject of um, an individual needing um, kind of support or adjustments. Um, next slide. Um, so something else we've been working on um, uh, this year is the Buckland Review of Autism and Employment. And um, so this was announced um, back in March 2023, and it's a partnership with Autistica, um, the Department of Work and Pensions, and Sir Robert Buckland is sort of the champion um, for this review. Um, so throughout the year, we've been carrying out a series of roundtables with autistic people, charities, employers, range of different companies, um, range of different sectors, exploring um, a number of of themes but ultimately to really understand what the barriers are to employment for autistic people and also the barriers to career progression um, but also identifying potential solutions and things that um, that could change um, and improve um, uh, outcomes for autistic people in employment. Um, so it's all sort of heavily guarded at the moment the report um, it is at the final sort of sign-off stages and um, was actually signed off but now there's been sort of ministerial change around and um, so the, the plan is to launch that in early um 2024 i think given the recent ministerial changes it might end up being pushed slightly into february um but we um we will kind of keep um people updated on our website as to when that's um due the launch will be very kind of public media launch and we will be having a launch event um, inviting a number of companies along um, to that and trying to get their buy-in for some of these recommendations. Um, this report is about companies um, making change. It, it, it is mostly recommendations for, um, for organisations. Um, so that will be the focus of the report. Um, next slide, please. Um, so last week we um, released, or rather pro bono economics on our behalf, released a report um, on the economic and social benefits of employing autistic people, um, specifically focused around our goal of doubling the employment rate for autistic people. Um, I won't go through all the stats here, but um, I guess the big headline stat is um, if we double the number of autistic people in work, the benefits of society could be up to £1.5 billion. Pounds. Um, so these are these are all sort of big numbers, and I guess the point is, yes, there are huge benefits um, to employing autistic people, but ultimately we need investment in support. They, these numbers kind of just make the case really for um, the needs for um, kind of employment readiness programs, um, career support, um, and um, so that's sort of the point of the report. It's available on our website if you want to sort of drill down into the into the data. Um, it should be sort of our top news item if you want to go and have a look um, in more depth um, into the report. Next slide. So I know and now I'll hand over to Michelle, who's going to talk to you about the um, Neurodiversity Employers Index. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Michelle Newman. Um, I'm a research fellow um, in the science team here at Autistica. 
Um, so what I'm going to do now is obviously Rebecca set out our ambitious goals and about what we're planning on doing and leading them to 2030, but actually how do we get there? Um, so I'm going to talk about some of the project work that we're doing um, and talking specifically um, about one of our flagship projects. Um, but before um, I talk more about um, these projects, I just wanted to give some context actually to the nature of the work we do and actually how we conduct the work. Um, so obviously you probably um, observe people of you would have noticed that obviously we're autistica and we're primarily focused on autism, but actually the neurodiversity employees index is looking at neurodiversity and it's the same with um, some of the, um, the um, materials that Rebecca was talking about as well. There's a very um, important reason, actually more than one reason for why we do that. Um, we know that um, a lot of people with autism um, actually have comorbid conditions. What we mean by that is they might not just be autistic, they might have other neurodivergent conditions or other health conditions. So for example, some people with um, autism might also have ADHD, dyslexia, dyspraxia, dyscalculia, um, OCD, a tick condition, and then also some of those psychiatric and psychological um, conditions as well, such as anxiety. Um, so we also know that a lot of the barriers and challenges in terms of getting into employment and thriving within employment, and um, there's a lot of um, crossover across the different kind of neurodivergent conditions. But actually, really importantly, a lot of the solutions also have a lot of crossover as well. Um, so that's one of the reasons why we actually look at neurodiversity on a more broad level, but that also corresponds to actually with what a lot of organisations are looking for, because of all these reasons, organisations at the moment are looking for support for neurodiversity and neurodivergent conditions, typically more than a specific um, condition. So that's why particularly with employment, it works um, much um, more broadly on neurodiversity. But what that does mean is that we're not just targeting that 2% of the population um, with autism, we're actually looking at a much bigger level, which um, can be, depending on what the statistics are, somewhere around 15% of the population. Um, what else is really important to talk about as well when, when we're talking about the work we do and particularly the research work that we do is that everything we do is alongside and working with the neurodivergent and autistic communities. Um, that is from the conceptualization of um, all of the work that we do. So those six goals that Rebecca spoke about earlier were developed by consultation with the um, autism community, um, how we design our research projects and how we test our research projects. All of that is done in combination um, with the neurodivergent autism community. Um, and the Neurodiversity Employees Index was particularly one of those. Um, we had um, a group of um, people with different um, neurodivergent conditions to be part of. Um, so that just sets some of the context about how we developed, how we came to um, working on these goals and how we decided to um, approach them. So what I'm going to do over the next 10 minutes um, is talk um, in more detail about the Autistic and Neurodiversity Employees Index, but also about some of our other projects as well. Um, so one of the key um, concerns that we heard repeatedly from organisations is that often organisations, they want to make change, but just don't know where to start. And I think Rebecca spoke about this point earlier as well, um, that also, also organisations are concerned about doing the wrong thing or saying something the wrong way as well. Um, so one of our solutions to support organisations that hire people is the Neurodiversity Employees Index. And what this is, is an annual reporting program that basically um, helps companies to assess um, how they are um, doing in terms of meeting the gold standard of best practice of neuroinclusive employment. It sets out that framework of what is best practice. And what we mean by best practice is this is what we know works. There's a strong evidence base um, within ac um, academic scientific um, research that has demonstrated that these, um, these different initiatives, these different programs actually make a real positive impact on um, neurodivergent um, employees' well-being. Um, it measures the processes and practices that you have in place. Um, it also engages with employees to understand that culture but also to look at gaps. And that's really important as well. Organisations might think that actually, you know, we're doing all of this, um, but actually there might be aspects that for your particular workforce aren't actually necessarily the right thing. So it captures some of those gaps as well. Um, all of that cap calculates that annual neurodiversity index, um, which is set against the 
predefined constructs on there. But actually, probably the most important aspect on there, and if you could click the, the button for me, please, um, is that it actually feeds back um, to organisations what their areas of strength are and what their areas of weakness are. And the most important part is it tells them, gives them organisations that roadmap about how those improvements could be made. Um, if you can move to the next slide, please. You might have to press it twice. Thank you. And what's also really important with this as well is we have an accreditation program. So there's two elements of this, um, participation accreditation program um, for organisations that have just taken part. Um, we also are um, offering an award program for not those organisations that are not only meeting standards of best practice, but are actually going beyond them. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we work with um, the communities that our projects are focusing on. And so for a lot of our employment projects, that's also thinking about the employers. So we also had um, an advisory group of people that were HR and diversity and inclusion function experts. Um, and when we were designing this program, um, it came up um, a couple of times um, from those people that were part of this, actually how important that having an accreditation program could have for the organizations. Um, particularly for organisations, particularly for sectors in um, investment industry sectors that have currently got talent gaps, it can act as that beacon to attracting talent, particularly the talent that wouldn't normally um, be approaching these kind of typical jobs. And so that was a really key feature of our design with, um, with this as well. Um, next slide, please. Um, another concern, I'm sure, um, You've probably um, all heard of this, or you might have come across this before. Um, particularly when talking about any kind of diversity and inclusion um, initiative, there's always frequent concerns and criticisms about these um, initiatives being just a box ticking exercise that um, senior management can now tick the box that they've demonstrated they've done that. But actually, it doesn't really mean there's anything meaningful for the employees. And um, we're really, really conscious of that. And it's something we've been particularly keen that we're not just um, offering another box ticking organization for companies. Um, and so we have deliberately developed this. That this is actually a tool that organizations can use to be um, building um, a much more kind of long term commitment towards being um, a neuro inclusive workplace. Um, and it's actually demonstrating, and we're hoping that is we'll get the actual merit um, publicly that this isn't just that box ticking exercise, that is, this is really um, organisations properly committing to supporting their employees. Um, so it is a cyclical programme that organisations will have to take part year on year. Um, so but what it does is whilst we're supporting organisations to um, assess and how well they're meeting, meeting that benchmark, we're also supporting them by helping them to monitor and, and assess that progress that they've been making on there. So what they need to do is um, on an annual basis, um, we take part in to um, renew. And actually what we really are hoping for is that they improve their NDR score and their accreditation award as well. And the next slide, please. Um, so how does this work um, in practical sense? I'm not going to talk through all of these individual points um, because obviously you all have the slides. But basically, um, it was very much designed that this is cross-sector and cross-size. Um, you know, we are aware that there are um, consultation companies that are out there that do offer services to companies, but not every organisation in the UK actually has the resources to hire the services of these organisations. And we were very keen, given how many of the um, organisations in the UK are actually small to medium um, companies, um, be um, offering something that supports those organisations that don't necessarily have huge financial resources. Um, so the NTI has very much been um, designed that it is capturing across all different sectors and sizes of organisations. Throughout our development phase, um, we have been working with organisations across sectors and across sizes, and that was as part of our advisory group um, in our pilot testing, where we have worked with 30 different organisations. Um, and then more recently, we have been going and um, conducting an early release um, phase with 200 organisations, capturing that broad spectrum. Um, some of that has been the sort of typically traditional and commercial companies that tend to be involved in these initiatives. But actually, we have also been working with local authorities and um, public services, such as a lot of the NHS trusts and police services um, and some local education authorities as well. So this has very much been designed for people that sit outside of that um, traditional kind of um, 
commercial office-based sector that a lot of the researchers actually come from as well. It does work on an annual period, as I said, it's the same annual period um, each year. Um, so it runs for about six to eight weeks that companies will submit and their responses. There's an employee survey, um, which goes out to all employees, regardless of whether they've disclosed and that they're neurodivergent or not. Um, I think one of the other speakers picks up on some of the challenges around disclosure um, a bit later, so I won't talk too much about that. Um, and then the other sections need to be filled in by somebody who actually has information access to the kind of HR um, information. So usually that's somebody from HR or from a DEI function. Um, and what companies receive is they get that roadmap report. We also um, will be publishing an, an annual market trends report. So that helps organizations to understand where they are in terms of their, um, where they sit in terms of their peers, but also um, given that we are a researching and campaigning organization, it helps us to understand um, where things are moving, where more work needs to be done. We've set our plan out where things are now. We need to understand maybe in five years where things are evolving. Hopefully there's been huge amounts of change been made and we need to understand where does the next evolution of that come from. Um, and then obviously we have the award as well. Um, what happens after this as well, which is hopefully the really important part, is that organisations have that um, report and they make their changes and their, their organisation. Um, a key factor in this is that it does sit organisations um, for whatever their current situation and their current resources are. Um, not every organisation has got the means to be able to run an internship programme, for example. But actually, what is really um, important to understand is that a lot of the, um, the, the a lot of the markers that are within the NDI that we're suggesting of best practice are actually at either low or no cost. And that's always come up in research um, with organisations that one of the biggest barriers for organisations putting in place um, these adjustments is because of concerns about actually the economic cost about doing that and also the, the administrative cost on that. But actually a lot of these really low budget um, or no cost on there at all. Um, if you could move to the next slide, please. So how could you get involved? Um, so we are currently running, we're just coming to the end of that early access period. So this was with 200 organizations. We do have a couple of um, places still available um, that we will be running this um, in January. Um, so if you would be interested in being part of that early access period, um, we would be happy to talk with you in more detail. Um, now, the advantage of obviously being part of that is that you'd be that vanguard of organisations that are trying to change society to be much more neuro-inclusive. Um, get everything that I've just said about that report, et cetera, in there, but also it's being offered at a no cost as well. Um, and as I said, we've worked with a lot of, um, of those sort of um, public services and local authorities as well. So it is something that definitely um, could sit with yourselves. Um, if those timeframes don't work, because I'm aware that's very, very um, immediate, but we're nearly in January, uh, as Rebecca said, we are publicly launching this in the spring of 2024. Um, so we would also be happy to speak with anybody about this and um, about maybe being part in the public um, launch when we get to that. And um, if you can move to the next slide, please. Um, so I'm just to take a couple more minutes and then um, before we finish and um, just talk about um, our future projects. So the Neurodiversity Employees Index is not the only project that we're working on. Um, we are, do have um, a whole program of works that we will be working on over the next um, few years that we're either funding other organisations or we're partnering with other organisations um, to be doing, or that we will be conducting them within our own research team and camps. Um, if you can move to the next slide then, please. Um, so we're basically taking um, a two-pronged approach on here um, in how we're setting up to achieve that. Really importantly is thinking about the support for autistic people, um, Rebecca mentioned some of these aspects in there. He's thinking about um, some of those programs, such as employment readiness programs, specialist coach and um, work coaches, career support profiles. Some of these projects, that, such as the career support profile, is currently in progress. Um, and we are working with public services, such as universities and job centres, um, to put these practices in place. Um, and then the Neurodiversity Employers Index is supporting the employers alongside other work, where we're working with organisations and, and with people um, to bring in place some of these. So what we're doing across both of these sections, you know, we're developing, we're control testing some of these initiatives. Um, and also in terms of developing guidance for employers um, to be able to put these initiatives in place. Um, Rebecca, I'll hand back to you.
Thanks, Michelle. And um, if you can move to the next slide, oh, yeah, final slide, be great. Um, so um, just really in terms of kind of how you can get involved in our work um, sort of beyond the Neurodiversity Employers Index, um, obviously, as I mentioned before, we have got the um, Employers Guide to Neurodiversity and the opportunity to register for ongoing updates specifically on our work on employment. So um, you can visit that URL there. Um, to, to register for those updates um, and if you have a kind of personal professional or um, connection to autism and want to get involved in research and um, that could be in employment but it could be across any six of our goals and um, you can join the autistic network and, and I've included a link there too and um, so yeah that's it from us if you can move to the last slide I think I've got our contact details there if anyone wants to get in touch um, and we're happy to answer any questions at a later date if they don't get answered today. Well, thank you, Rebecca and Michelle. Um, uh, we've got some questions in the chat that we'll respond to later. Really, really interesting presentation. And I don't, I, I love your ambitions and I want to work together with all our partners to make sure we try and get them right, all of them, because they seem very straightforward to me, um, which is, um, and it must seem very straightforward to you as well. So that's really, great we're now talking about straightforward and practical we're now going to move on to an example so if you want to move the slide forward for us on to a really practical example of a council working with employers working with dwp and um, other partners on the ground to really move forward some practical solutions for some um, autistic people and some neurodiverse people um, and Fiona, Peter and Neil are going to tell us a little bit about it and introduce themselves. Fantastic, thank you ever so much Kirsty and hello everybody. hello everybody, welcome to our webinar today about our partnerships that we've made in Plymouth with the, um, the precise aim to try and improve um, paid employment for neurodivergent people. Um, my name is Fiona Gordon. I work for Plymouth City Council as part of the commissioning team. Um, and uh, my co-partners on this webinar today are Peter from um, Babcock and Neil and Sean from um, CTEC Plus. But they will be taking part in this uh, webinar today and um, it won't be long before you will see them. So the um, if you go on to the next slide, please. That'd be great. So today we really want to share with you the lessons that we've learned uh, and uh, it was really great to, 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 to listen and to acknowledge the, um, you know, the data and the statistics and all the work that Autistica have done um, and only emphasises, you know, the things that we have found in Plymouth uh, and, and, and how important it is to, um, and this is no surprise, to put people in the centre uh, and, and actually really listen to um, neurodivergent people and their families uh, right from the start um, and to be able to work closely um, with all of our partners as well uh, none of this is none of this is new but I think it's about how you actually bring people together and actually really kind of learn from what's happening um, so to be able to kind of understand the critical importance of um, paid employment and um, I think more than anything, I think that's kind of our journey, really, that how important it was to really begin to acknowledge paid employment. Um, and it's something that we all kind of took, took actually took for granted, um, how our neurodiverse employment network has actually um, kind of blossomed um, over the last couple of years. Um, and and the what we've learned and that obviously what works and what doesn't work and obviously um, starting with our or ending with our kind of plans for the future on where we are. We're informed by um, by parents and by people um, in the centre of this around the the difficulties, the, the real extreme difficulties of actually actually finding paid employment. Uh, and actually, you know, how people were really, really struggling with that, knowing where to go and what to, what, you know, who to speak to. Um, we, as part of our Autism Partnership Board as well, um, we also um, were able to kind of really understand what that is, really listening to what people were telling us um, and um, around the importance of, uh, of actually trying to find um, paid employment. Uh, we were lucky to, to have some new services that were commissioned. 
um, during the pandemic around um, supporting people um, post on a post-diagnostic kind of basis and and the data and the information and the outcomes that people were requesting um, from that kind of process, process as well, were you know uh, influenced what we what we saw and how we started to change how we were working because we began to realise the size of the, the you know the difficulties that actually people were having, um, and I think the level of parental frustration that that we saw um, and we heard is something that I won't forget in a long time around um, I think it was that complete frustration about trying to find the right support you know the, and the presumability of employment as well uh, and, and I think for everybody on this call you know um, that that's where we kind of started from really um, we also, um, in conjunction with PLUS, um, who'd actually, who will be able to tell you about some of the work that they were doing with the uh, Disability Employment Advisors and the DWP about some of the kind of the emerging need that we were seeing there. Um, and I think we, we started to pull all this together um, to be able to start to um, shape our service offer over, over the, the, the years from the pandemic. I don't know, Neil, would it, did that kind of echo what you found? Yeah, you're right, Fiona. I think us as a support employment provider, we did a bit of reflection in terms of our national programmes that we deliver, um, understanding that um, sometimes that one size fits all isn't going to work for the uh, community of people that are neurodivergent and that those individuals needed a much more bespoke, bespoke type of service. We were seeing... Uh, some individuals coming through and they were disengaging um, because those larger uh, uh, national contracts, as I say, weren't able to provide the uh, personalised type of service that they, they would need. Um, so um, we did quite a bit of reflection about that, realising that we needed to adapt things and work with Fiona and other partners to, to, to deliver a service like this. We also understood as well that uh, as much as we were all supporting uh, disability confidence um, and working with fellow uh, employers in the city, we also understood there were still some challenges there in around, you heard from Autistica earlier, talking around the fear, worries about getting it wrong, um, and sometimes just shying away from providing uh, employment opportunities for people that are neurodivergent. So we wanted to, to also take that opportunity with this service to do a bit of myth busting, but also treat employers as customers of our service as well, to bring them along to help them see uh, the benefits of uh, recruiting the individuals that are neurodivergent and just that fantastic skill set that they would have. Um, so yeah, some, some, some great opportunities here for, for all partners involved. Um, okay, I think Thanks, next slide. slide, I think, Fiona. Okay, um, as, we, as we'd sort of previously said, I think it was around the kind of the emerging partnerships that we began to see in Plymouth. And uh, as you can see, the PASS is um, uh, Plymouth Autism Spectrum Services, a new service that we commissioned just, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic. And I think um, it, they were absolutely critical in being, being able to kind of test out and really understand this, the, the size of, uh, of, of need uh, for people to actually have paid work. And as you can see, I'm not going to read out the stats there, but you can see it's just under half of the referrals really were around um, people who required um, employment related support and some of the outcomes that um, people, people were looking to seek. Um, and I think, um, in relation to um, the actual data itself, I think that was really powerful for us as well as we began to look at how could we kind of gather resources and um, be able to move forward with that. Um, but what were some of the, um, uh, what were the other initiatives that happened, Neil? Um, so we also saw that um, because <laughs> we started this service on the tail end of one of the lockdowns, um because we thought well actually we needed to start straight away um, and we couldn't delay any further but some of the other outcomes we were seeing that the people were socially isolated so there was a real benefit in working with PASS whereby we as a support employment provider could concentrate on the support employment element but that other holistic support was then covered off by PASS and we could make sure that people were being supported to travel training become much more independent and get back out 
to what was deemed to be normal life again. So that was quite key. Um, we did a lot of focus uh, groups as well with the neurodivergent uh, community. And um, they were telling us that retention support was key, that it's not just about getting the job, but equally be about to stay in that role, be uh, have, the, have the same opportunities for training, career development as everybody else has. So we put that element within uh, the service as well, alongside the traditional CV building, interview skills, um, and developing those people in there. I'm not going to steal Sean's thunder, Sean's next to me, but you're going to hear a little bit uh, from her also and around that support around the culture. So not just actually learning the job, but what is it like to fit in to an employer and that place and what the culture looks like. Thank you. Next slide, please. Right, I'd like to pass you over to, to Peter from Babcock to talk through the journey that he has had uh, from a perspective with Babcock about an amazing work that happened in there with the Neurodiverse Employment Network that they have, but also he's going to weave in the work that we've all been doing in relation to the, the Neurodiverse Employment Network in Plymouth, um, uh, which obviously, uh, again, was a result of a partnership between lots of passionate uh, uh, people and organisations uh, from the City Council, plus the DWP, uh, our Plymouth Parent Care of Voice and the Plymouth um, Autism Partnership Board as well about the power and the importance of uh, paid employment for people. So over to you, Pete. Okay, thank you. Next slide, please. So, uh, as Fiona and, and Neil indicated, there was a lot of work going in the background, and um, Babcock have been looking at uh, neurodiversity sort of in great detail since about 2018. We launched our neurodiversity network in October 2018, and we actually have advisors set up and a lot of provisions for our staff. In that time, we've helped over 500 people get. Uh, screened and assessed or get information about how to support themselves, the family members, or support managers in how um, to sort of work with neurodiversity and be sort of neuroinclusive. So coming from these conversations, if we go to the next slide, we um, met up with Fiona and Neil at sort of in the late 2021, and we talked about what we were doing as an organization and what was going outside in, in the city. And then we came up with the concept of working together across the city as a network of employers that could reach into each other, talk to each other, get advice, talk about what works, what doesn't work. So uh, we came together in February 2022 and we invited um, a whole host of organizations across the city. I think we had over 70 people turn up to the day event. Uh, we did some talks about neurodiversity, the challenges in the city, and what it was like to be a big employer and work with neurodiverse staff within a big employment, employment setting. And in the afternoon of that conference, we got together and we asked the city what they wanted. We went to everybody and said, what would you like to see? If we were going to launch a network, we needed to make sure that it was the right network and achieving the right things. So from there, we managed to get a good idea of what the city wanted, which we'll see sort of a bit later in the presentation. Um, and then we started working on a framework to develop that and deliver that. So it took us a while to deliver it. It was a lot of times when it felt like it was a talking shop, but now we're actually starting to see some uh, actions and then some actually proper outcomes that are coming from this network. So um, as we've evolved, we've started to set objectives for all our different work streams. And we're starting to really see a difference in what we're making. And it's, it's really made us all very proud. So if we click to the next slide, please. So within our framework, um, we, we looked at it. We could boil an ocean or we could become a talking shop. And we really didn't want that. What we wanted to do is actually make proper action. So we set up uh, five work streams. So at the top, we've got the governance aspect. So this is what the network's about. This is where we look at the strategic aspects of the network. Um, sometimes we go and speak to our local MPs, talk about what it's like to be an employer with neurodiverse individuals and what they bring to work. So it's not just the neurodiverse person that you're dealing with. It could be managers, it could be screening assessments, the weight of the NHS. And they also, with our employers, they bring along, uh, employees, sorry, they bring along 
uh, their home lives too. So they might be supporting neurodiverse children at home and that might be something they bring to the workplace. So we, we have that aspect. So we also looked at sort of best practice. Like we said, some employers are scared of um, getting it wrong. So we want to be a friendly arm around the shoulder in terms of sharing best practice, what worked for us in a sort of more um, uh, laid back, more informal way, you can come and talk to us so, and be local, it really makes a difference. We looked at the communication. So obviously we need to communicate who we are, what we're doing and give information. And we're looking at the communications plans about raising awareness as well. And then we looked at support and advice. So we wanted to look at what was across our city. As we discovered, there was lots of different things going on in silos. And it was brilliant to pull that together and actually for us to talk together about what was going on in the city. And the last one, which, um, which is always the most exciting one to talk about, is going into the schools, going in and showing uh, young children that um, there's companies out there who are neuroinclusive to actually go and sort of really sort of make sure they're not fearful for their future and they know that people, we are aware and about um, giving breaking those stereotypes from a young age actually talking about the subject talking about um, understanding yourself and what you can do and how you set yourself upright to have a good career and if we click I think got a, a pop-up on this slide uh, we ran a series of uh, presentations around ADHD to start off with and we had fantastic feedback. It was a really popular subject going into the schools and actually talking to the children about it and talking about not being a badge, about it being something that you understand yourself and how to get the best out of yourself. So if we move to the next slide. So what we also wanted to do was actually make a commitment as well. So being part of our network, being local, there were things that you needed to do. So it was about looking at about sort of what you could do if you were a small employer, working through up to being a large employer and going out externally into the community and actually being a community presence. We looked at supported internships, supported apprentices. So we want there to be a commitment to sign up to the network as well. And we got our vision, which was to empower our current and future network to, uh, workforce to maximize their potential. And we want to support and embrace their conditions and we want to inspire future generations. Can we go to the next slide, please? So as you can see, we've had a really good sign up. Um, when we checked this morning, there was 26 organizations signed up to uh, be part of our network. And this is growing. Um, it's becoming really popular and we're getting a lot of employees come in who, like we said before, are scared, don't want to get it wrong. And again, this is about us having that friendly, open communication with them. Okay, if we go to the next slide. So I'll pass you on to Neil. Lovely, thank you ever so much, Pete. So um, yeah, this is a bit of a treat actually. So this afternoon, I'm joined by the lovely Sean here. Uh, excuse us while I don't keep looking directly at you because Sean and I can have a bit of a conversation now uh, that you're gonna hear all about Sean. Uh, she is one of our customers uh, on our neurodiverse employment service, um, but we felt that it would be important to hear from somebody around reasonable adjustments um, and what's worked and also what hasn't worked as well. So good afternoon, Sean. Hi. How are you? Are you okay? Yeah, good, thank you. Good, good. Right. Don't, don't worry about that <laughs> lot. Just <laughs> we can have a nice Fine. conversation now just between the two of us. So um, as I say, you're a customer within our service. Um, but previously, you've been an interior designer, yes, haven't you? that is my degree as well. That's in your degree as well. Yeah. Right, okay. Now, tell us what it was like when you first moved into that job. Uh, it was an interesting process. I started through work experience, um, which partly was to help me learn some of the programme, but actually from a neurodiversity side of things, was quite useful for me to see how I potentially fitted in the role. Um, and it was, uh, I knew I was dyslexic at the time, now, later since, we've looked at ADHD and potentially autism. Um, so it's been a bit of a journey. And I think, yeah, one of the things that would have helped is um, there was an assumption about dyslexia that it is a reading and writing thing. But sure. actually, for me, it's more than that. So the assumption wasn't necessarily particularly helpful, mm -hmm. whereas a more curious kind of approach would have been useful because actually 
there were other things that it would have been easier to continue the conversation around if the curiosity had been there rather than sort of a full stop on the end of it. Sure, sure. So what, what were some of those things you um, need to get into? Things like breaking down projects. So okay. um, if you've got a whole series of pieces of work, where's the priority? A whole picture thing. Um, also, I have a very visual memory. So actually retaining dates and names and things is a struggle for me which means in certain circumstances, like picking up the phone, that can be really overwhelming. Mm. Um, but in other places, that's really useful because I can hold entire buildings in my head because I think in that visual space. Mm. So actually, for an interior design point of view, that works really well. Absolutely. So it's that that way up. Sure. And did you bring about those reasonable adjustments or how did that kind of work there? It was kind of... Um, I sort of just worked our way towards it really it wasn't necessarily a conscious thing i don't think um that because of the reading and writing side of things there was a um look at whether there was a bit of support i could have with you know just nudging the person next to me can you check this email um mm -hmm. i think i've written it in english but <laughs> can i get a second opinion um but then also actually it's it's hard work being the person that needs the support all the time it, okay. it drains it is a lot and I think from the other side of things actually if you need someone you need to support all the time that's probably hard too but I pick up computer skills really easily so actually I managed to find within the office a space where someone might have questions about computer stuff that I could answer so I had my useful pocket so then actually I didn't feel so bad about nudging someone to check an email or Lovely. those kind of things helping me break something down because it was a back and forth it was a skill share rather than yeah, just a one-way street which is a really nice thing mm. i think and we spoke before but did they actually change some of the environment around a little bit whereby previously were you sat somewhere else yeah well? there were a few shifts um and it just as the office developed different people started mm. uh, and things things changed so actually having someone sat close to me made life a lot easier when i started i was on a side of the room that was very sparse sure so getting someone to get up out of their seat to come over and give me a hand is quite a daunting thing when you've got anxieties and things going on of as course. well but then when there are people around me it's far easier to just nudge someone you can give you 30 yeah. seconds and and that's it good so we, we, we're speaking about you know, the role as reasonable adjustments for you actually doing the job but we also know it's bigger than that don't we yes actually fitting into a culture fitting into an environment if you've got any kind of examples of how you navigated that yeah so for me um you have the culture in a business of people especially in office of making cups of teas for groups mm. and i find that really challenging um that can knock out a solid 45 minutes to an hour um, right. because of the overwhelm, different orders, again, memory working in pictures doesn't necessarily fit with how many sugars someone wants. Sure. Things like that. So it becomes 10 minutes winding myself up to get to do it, then the process of doing it. And then I might have another 25 minutes to get my brain back into work mode. Of course. So actually, when you look at being a team player, that isn't necessarily conducive to that because then you've got 45 less minutes of work on the project. But actually there were other things I found I could do. So I watered the plants in the office. Great. Because that meant I could get up and move from my desk when I needed to, but it didn't take the same brain space, which was really helpful. Much more manageable. But you felt yeah. like you were then integrated within the workplace. Yeah, you I was had still a role. doing something that was yeah. benefiting everyone. Good. Yeah. Good. Um Sean, I could sit and talk all day long <laughs> to you. This is it's really, really lovely just to hear about your experiences. Um what's next for you? Uh, at the moment, I'm trying out some work experience that's due to be starting okay. um, with Delt to see how I get on, to see if I can work within their systems and things, because mm. it's potentially reading and writing all at a similar time. So it may or may not suit me, but it will be a chance to test it out because either it will be something I can tick on my list as a good thing, or actually I can cross it off. So when I know for looking at other jobs, what suits or not sure and they've been quite supportive as well yeah that? yeah yeah much easier to have a conversation with them because they were really curious about what it meant to me and it wasn't their assumptions on what it meant it was just a really open conversation which was really nice so going back to that point earlier about not making assumptions but yeah. having a curious mindset is actually where it all kind of starts from yeah 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 
Okay, um, we're going to move on in a moment, but just just mindful of if there was one thing that you could say to employers in terms of what they could do or change to make the process of getting work more achievable, what would you say to them to change? I think um, there's an element with, with trying to get work is clarity and things in job applications. Something like, like admin duties means a lot to me because I struggle with those, but actually for other people, it's it's a no brainer. Mm -hmm. So actually, what does that mean? Is there someone I can ask those kind of questions to? But also from a point of view of generally, um, more positive feedback in office settings would be lovely. It wasn't until I happened to get made redundant, thank you Brexit, um, <laughs> <laughs> that I got feedback of actually, you can just do, we can hand your project on the computer and you can just do it. Mm -hmm. If I'd have known that earlier on, it would have been far easier to figure out that skill balance. Um, so, and is easier then to take into other further jobs because I could turn up at Dell and say, well, I can just pick up computer programs. Of course. So it's that um, sometimes you need other people to point out the things that you're good at, especially if you've grown up neurodivergent because you do get a lot of negative feedback just from, just from life. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sean. No Thank worries. you so much for Thank coming you, in and joining everybody on the call. Um, just for your honesty and your reflection, it's really great. Um, and uh, yeah, have a lovely rest of the Christmas yeah. when it comes lovely. around. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. As, as we're looking at the sort of having reasonable adjustments and physical adjustments can be really simple. My favorite one is that physical adjustment uh, down in, uh, in the bottom of the screen there. Um, this is one of, an, one of our buildings. As you can see, there's little notches on the handrail so as you get to the third step down of the stairs the three notches to tell you all three steps from the bottom and then you get to the next one it's two next one it's one it's really simple but can make a massive difference to people with disabilities and it also can make a big difference to anyone working in your office if the lights went out if there was a fire alarm that would be a fantastic adjustment for everyone to make everybody's lives easier and the thing that we've noticed um, is that a lot of these can help everyone and they're simple. So for everyone who's got Microsoft um, off Windows uh, 360 or plus from there, you'll find a program called Immersive Reader in Outlook or in Word. And this can be a massive difference to an individual. So you don't have to pay any extra for it. It's out of the box and it's included. But what it enables you to do is change things like the color of emails, the color of your Word documents, and that can make a big difference with people can, with conditions like Erlen's and dyslexia, and enables them to read it easier. You can have things like line focus, space in the text, breaks into syllables and breaks down that wording for you, and it can even read aloud. And the way when we go and talk to people is it doesn't, you don't have to be neurodiverse to benefit from this. If you're tired, having your emails read aloud makes a big difference so what we're saying is it's simple so we can if we can offer things like that make people aware that there's brilliant technology available to them and it's really small and cost effective some of our biggest ones on site we work in a big industrial dockyard biggest dockyard in western europe and the sea pen has changed lives so the sea pens enabled uh, people who would normally hide that they struggle with their reading to read documents out loud and that means that they're doing the work safer. And that means that they're actually understanding the instructions that they're doing. And something I'm benefiting right now talking to you is active noise cancelling headphones. They um, change the sound from the outside of my office and cancel it out. So I can concentrate on your call far better. For someone with ADHD and dyslexia, that is a lifesaver. Uh, we also sort of looking at uh, technologies like brain in hand and profilers as well. So as we as we grow and with an organization sometimes being able to do five full diagnostics for individuals can be quite expensive it can be quite time consuming so we're looking at profilers screeners ways in which we can get people the help they need with the reasonable adjustments relatively quickly and it doesn't have to be difficult it doesn't have to be expensive but all it needs is for us to talk about it and talk about best practice okay should we go to the next slide Okay, I think that's me. Uh, and on reflection, the things that work w uh, well were the easiest to put in place, really. And it was actually really beginning to actively listen to what people were telling us um, and what people needed. 
And I think from then we, we began to see results because we were actually concentrating on the on. And as you can see from from what's been said around the, the, the actual real improvements um, and um, again, listening to people's stories and actually picking out the learning from that. Um, and we've also know that where, wherever we can, where, wherever we can identify improvements, that these need to be shared, recorded and shared within the within the partnerships that we have. Um, we know and understand with, you know, with funding for different types of services that we have to be held to account to the outcomes that we're delivering. And obviously being really clear on the on, on the on the research and the data that we're using as well to make improvements. But I think the most critical thing is the relationship and the trust that staff have built up with people who are looking for jobs and actually to be able to actually trust in somebody again when people have had multiple um, difficulties and things that have gone wrong in their life and actually start to see things turn around, you know, because I think people have been um, let down by a lack of understanding. And to be able to change this and share this within within the forums and the partnerships that we have in Plymouth has been really good. And I think it it also backs up the consensus of opinion around um, the research that's happening where the, um, the, the actual priorities need to be put in with employers to actually really begin to help them to understand, you know, the things that need to change the power of reasonable adjustments and the actual talent pool that is out there. And I think that's where we're starting to see a difference now. A case study from us was there was a young man who was in employment in a factory for about six months neurodivergent, was struggling a great deal um, with the management style, the environment, um, had a really negative experience of employment. He came to our neurodiverse employment service um, just a couple of months ago, really lacking in confidence, very low and high levels of anxiety. They wanted a part-time job in retail, um, uh, but realised that working full-time previously was too much, so they wanted to do part-time. Uh, we've worked with them on their confidence, supporting their job searching, and most importantly, working with them in their local area so that they could become independent. Um, so we I'm pleased to say that they uh, applied for a position as a customer team member at co-op, um, and they declared that they were autistic and had ADHD. We secured a job interview, and co-op uh, kindly supplied the interview questions beforehand. So we were able to do some mock interviews with them, um, and they actually got the position. Um, they, they were up against a number of individuals at the interview stage. There was two fantastic candidates, and our individual that came through our service um, did so well, they actually created another role for them as well. So they were offered an 18 hour contract with the opportunity to work overtime. Um, the manager there was fully aware that the individual customer seat was neurodivergent um, and they've put in a huge amount of support. So they've given them a buddy in the workplace. They've got regular check-ins with the manager um, and the individual who we checked on just the other week is saying that they now feel part of a family very supported and understood um, and uh, are doing extremely well. They're doing so well that they um, are actually the, the quickest person to have learnt their roles and responsibilities in the bakery department. And they're now running the bakery department on a Saturday, which is their busiest day. Uh, the manager's over the moon with them. Um, and we're seeing the confidence and independence increase in the individual. So they're going from strength to strength. Um, and we're sure they're going to exceed all expectations. John was diagnosed with autism at two, and he uh, runs through a script when he talks to people. So he's uh, um, he's struggled with sort of his communication uh, for all throughout his life. But John went through a fantastic program at Reach, and since then has done incredible work working in Babcock in a supported internship. And it resulted in John winning the Rising Star Award at the 2022 Celebrated Neurodiversity Awards because he's done such an amazing job just being supported correctly in the workplace. So please, when you get a chance, have a proper review of this slide. These are the plans for our, our network. Um, if you get a chance to read through these, this is what we want to achieve. Um, and we're always willing to partner up with different organizations and teams to make this happen because if we work together we can we can make employment neuro inclusive 
Yes, just to add, thank you ever so much um, for listening to us, and I hope you found our um, experiences interesting. Uh, we know we're a couple of years down the pathway that we're on, uh, but we can see that we're just really beginning to start to see change around increasing neurodivergent employment in Plymouth. But as a network, we are so much stronger in everything that we're doing, and we think we've got a great chance of achieving real sustainable change in Plymouth, which is what we want to do. So thank you ever so much for your time. Um, and I'd like to hand back to Kirsty. Thank you ever so much, everybody. Thank you, everybody, for that. It's always really brilliant to listen to someone's um, story. And I know it's generated some questions about banks of documents and access to learning, which I hope we'll be able to pick up at the end. I think what's quite nice is our final presentation, and we're going to have some Q&As after this, is from Alex Hedman, who is going to talk a little bit about neurodiversity in business, which actually brings together some of the strands from the other two presentations um, and helps with some practical ways of moving forward, um, as did the other presentations. So, Alex, over to you. Thank you. Honestly, I, I love doing sessions like this in particular where you know, I get to hear from other organizations and more importantly, those kind of case studies. It, it, it's always really heartening and fascinating to hear the the great stories and successes that, that we have in, in neurodiversity from all these different areas across across the UK. So really um, massive applause to, to everyone who's presenting before and, and thank you for the opportunity to speak. So um, we've kind of touched on it in, in little bits here and there, but I always like to, to kind of open these, these talks and these sessions with just starting from the very basics of what is neurodiversity. So it, it is very much that whole spectrum of human neurotypes. Um, so the, the original definition uh, was around kind of drawing parallels to the concept of biodiversity that much like the uh, biological world around us has a wealth of diversity within species and genuses and all of that stuff. Um, the human brain has very much the same thing. And, and where I like to start this um, at the kind of base level of that definition is recognizing that although neurodiversity is a budding topic, we've been talking about it in some places for a while, it is very much getting mainstream over the last kind of few years. And with that, it, it, it's hard to guarantee that everyone is on the same part of their journey, right? Everyone is at different points, as uh, the speakers before me were saying, um, you know, from neurodiversity and business, from the work I do here, looking at different organizations, everyone is at different places on an individual level, but also on an organizational level. So starting from the ground up and making sure we're all using the same kind of language and the same views and, and understanding of what we're talking about really helps. So as you can see um, from the right hand side as well, that there is 15 to 20 percent is is the accepted estimate of the UK population that it's neurodivergent. Um, this really does, it, you know, we talk about it, it rising sharply in STEM tertiary education, but when you drill down into organizations and sectors and industries in particular, that number starts to really actually increase. You know, if you look at the associative strengths, which we'll come on to a little bit later, um, areas like you know, investment or consulting may have a lot more of the kind of ADHD, the the autistic uh, individuals who ADHD like the fast paced are constantly moving the change and the autistic individuals may like the pattern recognition. So, you know, while it may be uh, 15 to 20% of the general population, different areas will start to see a rise. And we have to kind of bring that lens into the conversation when we're looking at and analyzing how we, how we make uh, the right support approaches in different areas. Um, but part of neurodiversity that I think people don't always necessarily kind of are, are aware of is that, you know, we have the big names along the side, um, but actually there's a lot more that is encompassed within it. So things like traumatic brain injury, for example, or, or just anything that actually affects the way that the, the neural pathways fire within the brain. It leads to differences in thought. That is a neurodivergent condition. And so um, it, it kind of changes the way that people normally think about it, where they do just think of typically autism, ADHD, dyslexia, or sometimes the dyscra dyscra dyscalculia, dysgraphia. There's also um, uh, developmental coordination dis uh, disorder, which is, and I can't remember the name that it normally goes by, dyspraxia. That's the word I was looking for. Um, but yeah, starting with that bit, if we can go on to the next slide. 
So neurodivergent strengths, um, we kind of touched on them a little bit in some of the other sessions as well, but I always like to call them out that it is very much that critical detail oriented, routine and repetitive work, design oriented, innovative, creative, sustained concentration. So that idea of hyper-focus is very much talked about. Essentially, it's really hard to overlook the strengths that neurodivergents have. Um, I think a lot to whenever I give these talks both in, in neurodiversity and business and, and also in my day job, because as you've seen at the start, I am a volunteer. Um, I always try and, and call out some of the examples to, to break those stereotypes that people have. So, you know, dyslexic, I've had dyslexic colleagues who um, may not be the best at, at spotting mistakes in their writing if they're doing bits like that, but, you know, you can easily help that and support them by having someone look over their work, and that's perfectly fine as long as they approach it in a helpful and compassionate, understanding and supportive way, but you can give them a, a spreadsheet. I've seen some dyslexic uh, individuals who you give them a spreadsheet filled with tons and tons and tons of rows of data, and they can just pump out the most insane analysis that you've ever seen faster than, you know, you could ever comprehend and your head would be spinning by the time they're done. So, you know, it, there is a lot of talent and, and ability that is just waiting to be unlocked if you find the right ways that the individual needs to be supported. And I think that's fundamentally the main bet, right? Is when we talk about neurodiversity, there is a default to, oh, here's all the assumptions and misconceptions I may have, or here's what I think someone with autism really likes to do, um, or here's something that I think someone with ADHD really likes to do, but it's not about that. It's about understanding the individual. And so the point that was raised earlier around why Autistica has, has kind of started to look at neurodiversity because of that comorbidity and having um, multiple conditions or as we would say uh, multiply divergent that's really what you want to look at as well is just because there is a condition that is disclosed doesn't mean that's the only condition and also doesn't mean that is what defines the person neurodiversity is very much defined by the individual's lived experiences and everything that's that's informed who they are now and so it's very much about moving away from not just the label and the identity that comes with that condition, but moving to the person that is behind that and what they might like and what their individual strengths are. Next slide, please. So this is one where visually, it's, it can be a little bit difficult, but it's also a great representation visually of how hard it is to put into perspective what the associative strengths are with neurodiversity. And what I mean by that is it looks like these are just, you know, each of those ones on the bottom are just only associated with the ones on top. It's not. This is the spectrum. And these are just some places where those conditions may fall and some can, places where those uh, associative strengths fall. But actually, it is a mishmash. It's a meld. It's, it, it, these are not restrictive to the conditions they fall under or around. So, you know, People who are dyslexic, who are dyslexic, for example, it's the first one that jumped out at me. The entrepreneurial, you know, you have Richard Branson, who's very openly dyslexic, but now you have people like, um, oh, I can't remember his name. He does the diary, the life of a CEO, um, but he's come out as say and disclosing that he has ADHD, as has the founder of, uh, what is it, Lad Bible. Um, Sorry, as you can tell, names, not my strong suit. Faces, phenomenal with them. I see someone has put in the chat, Stephen Bartlett. Yes, that's what it is. Thank you. Cannot remember names to save my life, but I will, as, as was said previously, I can remember dates like nobody's business. Um, so yeah, it's, it's not about being individual to each one. These are all shared in different ways. And a lot of that comes from being multiply divergent. It just comes from the individual bit. And it also comes from the fact that a lot of these conditions not just autism, but ADHD in and of itself is also spectrum. So a lot of these have different uh, components and different ways that they present in the individuals. And that's really important to bear in mind when you're looking at neurodiversity and neuroinclusion. Next slide, please. So, you know, we talk about what it means for the individual and what that looks like. And obviously there is tons of strengths, but what does that mean for an organization? Well, Neurodivergent individuals think differently, as we've said. So an innovative workforce and true diversity of thought is just better economically and it's better for efficiency. So it doesn't just mean in an economic stance, what we're not talking about here is just how much money can you get because it's not about commercializing neurodivergence. It's about also understanding that an economic aspect of that is how effective your organization is. So reducing errors, um, 
better teamwork and collaboration, retention, all of those things are actually economic factors as well within businesses. Sustainability, you know, we talk about um, there being that hidden talent pool, but also you can recruit until you're blue in the face when you're looking at neurodiversity. But if you're not retaining that talent, you are always going to end up back at square one. Right. You can bring in 500 neurodivergent individuals, but in three years, if they all leave, where have you gotten to? You have to not just focus on bringing them in, but also on keeping them in. Obviously, neurodiversity is covered by the Equality Act, too. So there is the legal aspect and making sure you're providing reasonable adjustments and making sure they are supportive. But it also very much is a visible part of it. So we've talked about the the role of role modeling and how important that is. And, you know, it's really great to hear the story um, that was shared about upskilling and, and empowering those individuals into getting into work. That's fantastic. And being able to tell those stories. I mean, I can't tell you enough of how many times I give these talks in, in my own work, uh, in member organizations, and just the conversations that I have with people after coming up and saying, uh, thank you so much for just talking about it, because it's made me feel seen and it's really made me feel supportive. Fundamentally, I'm not doing anything different than I am right now. I'm just talking about the concept of it, but being able to get up and share my story and having someone watch that is really impactful for them. And that's that, that is amplified when you are able to tell those stories outside the organization as well. And fundamentally, what we see, not just from our member organizations, but from society more broadly, it is just the right thing to do. And it is the right decision to make to be supporting and focusing on neurodiversity. Um, next slide, please. So, we do, obviously, we've made the very clear case that neurodiversity is a differentiator, but what I like to do in this slide is, is talk about something that um, I think a lot of people tend to overlook, which is looking at neurodivergence as a individual group and that neuroinclusion is only about supporting neurodivergent colleagues. And that's not the case. I think a great example of that is how impactful remote working has been for parents and carers, for anyone, essentially, who doesn't necessarily want to spend an hour plus of their day commuting to work um, and would much rather be able to just kind of roll out of bed a little bit before and have a bit of a lie-in, but still be able to also find that hybrid balance of being able to come in and socialize with people. That is a huge, huge reasonable adjustment for neurodivergent individuals, but also is one that benefits a lot of people, right? everyone benefits from remote working. Just like I imagine everyone would benefit from soundproof headphones. There is, a, especially in offices, there is a, a, a clear driver for the individuals to, for any individuals who have sensory issues. I, for example, when I'm in the office, really struggle with every movement, sound, thing, stimulus, will direct my attention, I will catch it because of my ADHD. I have to kind of see what's happening and it distracts me. Like in, I think it was Up, when there's the dog that points at the, the shiny thing, or no, it was Squirrel and just totally gets distracted. That's how I feel in the office. But having soundproof headphones really helps me to be able to block that. Conversely, someone who is autistic might really struggle with sensory overload and benefit from soundproof headphones to limit that. So those are two different ways, same solution, but two different reasons. And the same thing, again, applies to people who are neurotypical and don't have those sensory issues. Lots of people would probably much prefer to be able to just kind of get in the zone and not have to worry about the sounds around them in a busy office. So looking at it, not so much as how can I only help this one individual group, but how can the way that I help this one individual group, because their support needs are much clearer, how can that be rolled out and helped the rest of the workforce as well and be a differentiator for my whole organization. That's the, to me at least, the end point of what neuroinclusion and neurodiversity is really about, is it's not just about making workplaces better for neurodivergent individuals, it's about making them better for everyone. Next slide, please. So, who is NIB and, and what are kind of objectives? So we very much look at um, our, our neurodivergent individuals, our employers and our neurotypical individuals. So it's a very clear kind of matching of, of what we try and do for them that we want to empower, recognize, help and guide them to a successful, happy and independent career path. But a lot of that comes from 
creating that awareness um, with employers and more importantly, the neurotypical individuals who may not have that lived experience, whether that be from those around them or them or kind of family, we need to be focusing on kind of driving the understanding of what it means in reality and, and how people can bring neuro inclusion into their daily lives so that the nerd and divergent individuals can benefit from that. So the way we do this is NIB is an industry forum. And what that essentially means is we connect up what we call our community partners who are organizations that deliver neurodiverse nerd diversity or neuro inclusion services, uh, our ND individuals themselves in our community and our corporate members who are the ones that obviously need to do the learning and changing their their processes and their structures and they come to us to to look at how can we connect them up within the ecosystem so all these three stakeholders come together and we engage them and we draw on their experience in different ways so that we can listen and learn and be responsive to what's happening in industry we can bring in the knowledge and the expertise like from Autistica, from Genius Within, from Diversity and Ability, from our community partners and help that guide them, those corporate members in delivering services and transforming. And we can be uh, guided by and, and kept accountable essentially by our ND individuals from our community to make sure that we aren't becoming beholden to one specific group. And it's a kind of checks and balances much like a government has to make sure that we are not becoming just a, a, a mouthpiece for, for corporates to kind of do that tick box exercise. We aren't just focusing on the commercial aspects of it and we are bringing individuals at the heart of everything that we do. Next slide, please. So how are we going about doing this as an organization? Next slide, please. Uh, you can skip this one. I kind of jumped the gun on that. <laughs> so one of the things that neurodiversity in business is, you've hopefully seen it, but um, if you haven't, we produce, we sponsored the first global quantitative study of neurodiversity in the workplace. It was a uh, gap assessment of uh, neurodivergent individuals and employers uh, from all across the UK. I think we had north of a thousand or two thousand respondents. I can't remember off the top of my head, but a really, really fantastic and insightful uh, report that was done in partnership with the Centre for, Neuro for Neurodiversity at Work at Birkbeck University. Um, it has some phenomenal insights and outputs that I'll, I've pulled a few out to talk about at the end of this. Uh, but we are now in the, the second phase of this. So we've now contracted a second research with them. Um, and I will actually uh, ask my colleagues to to share the link in the chat. I've forgot to send it in advance because it only just went live on Friday, but we have a study that would be phenomenal for uh, everyone to please share. And I've apparently copied the wrong link, so I will do it after this. <laughs> um, it would be phenomenal for uh, you to share the link with your, your colleagues, with uh, anyone you come across, because the more data, the more respondents we have, then the more knowledge and insights and, and analysis we can draw off of it. Um, Debbie, you've asked in the, in the chat where the report is. It's available on our website. Um, I will make sure to provide that link as well. Um, it is about 40, 50 pages and there's there's lots of really great stuff in there. So definitely um, I've found a lot of, of use in pulling some of that out at work and having just kind of highlights that I put out to the community every week, every other week, and just kind of drip feed that content to make sure people are aware of, of what's out there. Next slide, please. We also have our annual conference. So in, in March of this year, um, it feels like it was ages ago, uh, in March of this year, there was our first ever annual conference, which saw 400 delegates attend. We had uh, community partners, we had corporate members, lots of really brilliant buzz and hearing a lot of brilliant thought leadership um, from all across the ecosystem, which brings us nicely onto the next one. Next slide, please, which is our 2024 conference. So another link I will be sharing because we have gone live and we have officially launched today, this morning. It has been uh, a very hectic last few weeks to, to get to that final push. But yes, we are we are live and we are going bigger, better and bolder is the uh, rule of three phrase I'm using for it. Um, 
that will focus on reducing stigma. Our, our overall theme is collaborating for impact. So we're looking at reducing stigma and supporting colleagues, innovating through workplace and product design and improving retention for neurodivergent employees. And essentially what the focus is, uh, as you can kind of tell by the, the, the overall theme of the conference is bringing up that ecosystem into the one place. So a, when I say bigger, bolder and better, it is a even bigger venue than it was before. Really fantastic. Lots of space for collaborating and networking. So if you're able to attend in person, please do. Um, and we will also have a virtual element. So we have space for an unlimited number of virtual attendees. So if you're not able to make in person, please do share widely within your networks because um, it is really important that we get as many people attending on the day because we will be running workshops and delivering panels, but the workshops are very much focused on co-creating in those spaces. And the idea here being we have our ND resource hub, which I think is the next one that I'll talk about, but we want our workshop facilitators to be focused on creating guidance and co-creating within our community partners, our ND individuals, our corporate members, those who attend on the day to really drive the thought leadership across the sector um, and really make sure that we're, we're staying on top of and unlocking all of the brilliant insights and talent that everyone has. I think for me, the why... Uh, neurodiversity in business as an industry forum matters so much is because everyone is kind of operating in different places and we're all doing a million different brilliant things and much like neurodiversity is this you know spectrum and, and broad way of thinking that means that neuro inclusion just has as much diversity of thought within it and our, I think the biggest challenge when we look at the way that, that business works today is is connecting up across are, are different organizations, right? There is no central meeting point to come together and discuss, oh, I've, I've tackled this in this way, I've tackled this in this way. And webinars like this are fantastic, but really bringing everyone together in different spaces to chat and to think and to brainstorm is super, super impactful and super important. So being able to, to drive that at this conference, I think is really important to me and it is going to be a really great opportunity for everyone to, to contribute. So definitely do share. But as I said, there's the, the hybrid element, which means if you're not able to attend virtually, there will also be a live stream on our show, socials. Um, and so we, we very much wanted to make sure that there is equitable access for everyone. So, you know, at the end of the day, there is, there's the, the, not everyone is able to afford the tickets. You know, if you're thinking of economically disadvantaged individuals of, in your community, please do share the link as well and let them know that it's being live streamed because they will be able to access the, the content and be able to benefit from that. And we will also be doing video on demand after. Um, Next slide, please. I'm getting rushed because I have time blindness and it's great. Um, MT Resource Hub. Uh, so the Resource Hub is a bunch of curated content from across our ecosystems, our community partners, um, resources that they've done. And you can go along to the website and be able to filter across what you're looking for in particular. Um, and uh, it's been one of our most impactful things that we hear about all the time that it really, really benefits. So if you're looking at how to drive the conversation and upskill people internally, do go along to that um, and have a look because it collates a lot of really great stuff from everywhere around neurodiversity and neuroinclusion. Next slide, please. So yeah, this was this is the, the study that I was talking about. If we go to the next one. So three key bits that I'll pull out. So ND strengths are key. So um, the Neurodivergent employees uh, very much have strengths that are key to innovation. So as we kind of said at the front, these are the hyper-focused creativity, innovative thinking. This is very much to kind of say, we aren't just pulling that out of thin air, the data does back it up. Um, but there fundamentally is an untapped need to embed neurodiversity into DEI policies. 92% of employers have a DEI policy, but only 22% said it includes a focus on neurodiversity. So there is a long way to go. Next slide, please. So how do you foster those strengths in the workplace? Honest conversations, looking at the design of your physical spaces, your technology and policy, and looking honestly at existing processes. The, the thing that I always tell colleagues is the best thing you can do fundamentally is just talk about it, is normalize the conversation. And when you're looking at existing processes, 
the most important thing to look for is where is the flexibility that you have within those processes to create the individual lens that you need to be able to be neuroinclusive. That's the fundamental challenge I think neuroinclusion has is how do you standardize things while also providing the flexibility for the complex different uh, diversity that exists within neurodiversity. Next slide, please. Stigma and discrimination. So 65% of neurodivergent employees are concerned about disclosing due to fear of discrimination from their manager. I believe it was then 55, 53% were uh, felt that there was not a staff member that was knowledgeable enough in neurodiversity. And 48%, I believe, uh, felt that their colleagues were not supportive either. So a lot of it comes down to driving that culture of acceptance and inclusion ourselves. So talking about it again is huge. Uh, but self-disclosure at the moment drives that access to adjustments. So the main data collection method was self-disclosure and the largest barrier to ac accessing adjustments was a lack of disclosure. The most important thing to, to kind of query and, and look at in your own organization is does disclosure should disclosure be a barrier to adjustments or is simply asking for adjustments and support enough to go off of? Next slide, please. So how to fight the stigma? Who should lead the conversation? Is it the employee, the ND employee, or the employer demonstrating their commitment? Um, making sure that you are having that senior leadership buy-in and most importantly, building in the psychological safety into those conversations. Next slide, please. Retaining talent neurodiversity friendly career pathways. So very much carving out and creating specialist roles rather than generalists. So if I think of what I do in my day job, um, I can get penalized for, for not being, I, I'm in consulting, I can get penalized for not doing my timesheets on time. Thankfully, I have an area of the business that is understanding of my needs and uh, knows that I'm just not great at admin. But that's a great example of how not everything that is a very generalized pathway or generalized roles and responsibilities and expectations fits the neurodivergent individual. And creating that individual lens is really important and developing a place where they can learn and thrive. So at the end of the day, 42% of neurodivergent employees are likely or very likely to leave your organization. However, with tailored adjustments, and here tailored is a very important word, it isn't just blanket adjustments for everyone. It is understanding and listening to the individual support needs and creating a program of adjustments that works for them. That number then drops to 18.2%. So a huge shift of over half, over 50% drop. Next slide, please. So the way that you do it and the way that you retain talent, as we said, recruiting is great, but you have to fundamentally retain them as you look at training, the workplace adjustments and making them tailored how you mentor them, how you create that culture of understanding and that mentoring and helping them understand how to really learn and thrive within your organization is incredibly important. And I think I've rushed through the end. I hope I managed to make it on time. Thank you so much for listening and uh, really looking forward to the panel. Amazing, Alex. Yep, dot, dot on time. So really well, really well managed through that bit there. What's been really lovely listening to these is the sheer enthusiasm that's come out of um, everybody's talked about. I suppose one of the challenges I'm thinking about now is uh, how people bring some from different places and different organizations, bring their knowledge and insight and actions together. But I'm sure that'll be a much longer conversation in another place. We had lots and lots of questions, which is fantastic. So I'm now gonna do a little bit of a quick roundup on um, the questions, some of which we can answer quite straightforwardly and other ones which I think will take a little bit of time. So I think if we take the slides down so that we can see everybody who's spoken today. Brilliant, thank you very much. So um, I we have some questions. So um, let's start with the last presentation first. Um, Alex, it's a good question, actually. Are there parts of the UK, are there parts of um, England where there are, there's more business active um, in your network or or is it all over the country? So it's, it's not even just all over the country. We actually have quite a global presence. So we've got a lot of multinationals that operate all over the world. Um, but I wouldn't say there's any place in particular in the UK that kind of over dominates. It's it's quite spread out and it's it kind of differs based on sectors. It's a bit of yeah, an odd answer. Brilliant. 
that's brilliant to hear. And I suppose what I have to do, the, there are people in the room who may want to speak to their HR um, directors and teams about how they can get engaged with this as something uh, that would be very helpful and send a clear signal. Um, yeah. I suppose this this is a question to everybody. I think really, it's it comes up in different places, but sometimes, surprisingly, um, you may have managers who say either they're very nervous about how to open a conversation with someone about what their um, what the adaptions might be, need, or just open the conversation up about support. So that's number one. And the second bit about it is um, what you do. I mean, I think I know what the answer is to this, but it's when you when you are working with the organisation, they say, no, 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 my managers haven't got time to be having these conversations. We're, we're far too busy getting on with, you know, delivering products or selling things. There's no way that we can sort of have these conversations. So that's two bits. The first bit is about people feeling that they can open the conversation. The other bit is the bit about places that say they're far too busy to engage in this. So who wants to go first on those? I'm happy to step in. Um, so I would always just say a conversation is the easiest thing just to talk about. Um, talk, we always start with strengths. So what are you strong at? So change the mindset. Don't look at where people maybe have challenges. Look at it as, like I say, the whole self. Start with that strength thing. So what are you good at? What do you really enjoy? And then just make an open conversation about... The challenges that they face and you'll find a lot of people will come out with the things that they need a lot of times it's really simple so um uh we we normally find and we we had this uh with the young chap who's on the end of our case study there where we were looking at his careers and his, um what he needed to progress in his career and we just had an open conversation just talk to him generally about what he really enjoyed what he didn't what what he found a struggle and then that naturally leads on to a lot of the reasonable adjustments as uh, alex was saying a lot of it is personal and the second one about companies not having time or or you know they're too busy um if you support someone with neurodiverse conditions correct you can get up to 30 40 percent increased output of, out of that person um you can get them to retain you can look you stay in in your organization so why wouldn't you be doing that it makes business sense to retain your staff properly to look after them properly and to get the best out of them so uh, that's what that would be my challenge does anybody else want to come in on that at all because i think it's a really intriguing question they both are so rebecca Oh uh, yeah, I was just going to talk to um yeah the, the point around kind of asking for adjustments and and how to have that conversation. I guess um so some of the findings from our UCL research I guess points out to the fact that actually a lot of autistic people wouldn't disclose um at work. Um obviously also there's a lot of people that don't know they're autistic as well. So this is about having a conversation with every member of staff, just make this a, a normal thing that you um, have that conversation as a manager with the individual. This is about neurodiversity, the fact that we are all, all of our brains work differently. We all benefit from different kind of working styles. And I think it, it's a cultural shift about us having this conversation with everyone, not just neurodivergent people. Um, but yeah, some interesting findings from the UCL research is that um, so one in three autistic people don't feel, didn't feel able to ask for adjustments or didn't ask for adjustments, but felt they would be useful. Um, one in four were refused um, reasonable adjustments when they when they asked for them. Um, and um, one in 10 um, fed back that um, those adjustments were kind of poorly implemented or in a lot of cases, and they might be implemented and there might be a lot of enthusiasm at the start, but it's kind of keeping that up um, and making sure that it's not just that sort of one manager that's um, putting in place that adjustment, but actually the whole team um, is kind of continuing um, that adjustment because, um, yeah, it, it's easy to make those adjustments when a, a member of staff is new, but these things often fall by the wayside we've, we've found in our research. That's brilliant and really helpful. And I love the thing. And I'm sure other people are going to say different, but let's start off with what our the people that work with us need to be as productive as possible rather than a uh, uh, label or a diagnosis. And I think that's quite a nice way of thinking about it. So I'm going to go Alex and then I'm going to go Michelle. Yeah. So kind of touching on what Rebecca said, the, the, it, there is 
the impetus and the, and the focus shouldn't be on the individual themselves, right? The, the neurodivergent individual. Uh, there is, if we look at neurodiversity as a whole, there is that social and medical model of uh, deficit model, right? Of disability, that you are inherently coming from a place of feeling less than. You have been taught that through traumatic experiences your entire life. And so to then in the workplace where an individual may be struggling to then say, oh, you as this different individual, you have to tell us how we can better support you. That is instantly going to trigger a lot of emotions in the individual and make it very difficult to come forward with anything that they need. So the way that you have to do that and get around that is to normalize the conversation, as Rebecca said. So what we see in in really great organizations that do this really brilliantly is using what's called, you'll hear them called manuals of me, ways of working frameworks, lots of different names that exist out there, but they're basically in teams and projects you talk through and you have dedicated sessions periodically, you talk through your profile. So it's who you are, some facts and fun things about you, how you like to work, what are the, your passions and things like that, and, and what are the things you need to know about working with me. So it can be, I'm ADHD, so I'm not an early morning riser, and I would much prefer that my meetings start at half nine or 10, um, but I will much rather work late into the night. And you know, if you're getting pings from me late at night because I'm doing deliverables, don't worry about it, pick it up in the morning, there's no emergency. But some other people will say, right, well, I've got to pick up my kids, I've got to do the car run at half three every day. So if we can make sure not to schedule any meetings there, that would be fantastic. So it moves away from your neurodivergent condition you need to tell us or it needs to be the focus to get the support to how can everyone be supported in whatever way comes about. And that's helpful, not just for removing the stigma and the barriers on the individual that's neurodivergent. It makes everyone feel comfortable in coming with their own needs and also helps you understand what are some reasonable adjustments we might all be missing because we just don't know. Because there's a fundamental philosophical issue <laughs> when it comes to being neurodivergent is you don't know what you don't know. So I've, I can't think of how many times I've been asked or friends and colleagues have been asked what support do you need and you just get a blank stare because if you've never been offered support and you've never been offered a cohesive offering of support you just don't know so there's no point in sitting there kind of saying what do you need to support because the individual has never had that opportunity and so it's that step change of making everyone feel more comfortable and, and talking about it they will kind of learn in their own journey how to be better supported and that's I think the the, the best way to look at it. That's a lovely answer. And uh, Michelle, you wanted to add into that conversation. Yeah, no, I, I pressed the wrong button, but I, I have got something I will add into that as well. Um, I think a really key point, um, all the points that have been made are um, definitely um, exactly points I would have added. The other thing is as well, is it's not just a one conversation. Um, what does come up time and time again, actually, um, within the research and the literature that's on this, um, and just when you speak to people, is that you know, a lot of... The challenges of always are transient, so it might not be the same thing on the same day or even at the same point in the same day. And so that conversation has to be had on a regular basis to make sure that you're still meeting the requirements of that person. Oh, that's brilliant, really helpful, really thoughtful stuff in there, which we'll capture in the recording. But also I think we probably there's room for a bigger conversation, isn't there, at some point around some of this? Because I think the same thing happens in health and social care around pinning someone down to a diagnosis or, uh, or an eligibility, which sort of hits the target but completely misses the point. So there's lots of interesting stuff in there. Right, so we have some few more questions. Um, which I think are really interesting. So I suppose, um, oh, there's a couple of really practical ones about the autistica work, which is, have, have you got any big players on board with your work at the moment? And I love the expression big players because, but hopefully you'll you'll get what that is. Rebecca, do you want me to pick that one up? Yeah. Um, we have been working with organisations from across sectors um, that includes, um, we're talking the financial sector, we've been talking with people that are in retail, travel, lots of different organisations. And as I was saying earlier, um, speaking with um, various different councils as well, there are some very well-known um, household names that have been interested in that. Um, confidentiality reasons, we can't share those. But yeah, no, there are some actually some really important questions. But um, as you know, some of the organisations we work with have got 10 employees, some of them have got as many as 5,000 employees in there. So there is a, a real breadth. 
Brilliant. That's really, really helpful. And is there a charge for it? Um, at the moment, no, there isn't. Um, there isn't definitely for um, certainly if you're taking part in the early access period um, and probably for the first year as well. That's really helpful to know. So we're on to the last couple of questions, and I think these are sort of some interesting things here. Um, and there are two questions that are, come up frequently in lots of other areas, which is um, around a shared document, a, a way of sharing documents from your learning. Um, but I think it applies to the others as well that, um, that an employer can pick up and use. Um, and I think I know what some of the answers that are going to be. And the other one is, and this is about embedding training in the workplace. So I think we could probably fill up about three hours with the workplace training question. But some initial thoughts from all of you on workplace training might be quite helpful just to place your position on it and what your thoughts are. So um, the first one is about um, sharing documents so that there's like a bank of things that can be used by employers to think through. And the other one is a bit about training. So who wants to go first on those? Fiona, brilliant. Yeah, I think from from talking to some of our employers, I think anything where people can access um, really good uh, quality, easy read, easy to understand um, documents and things, and templates that, that can be downloaded, uh, I think that's going to help um, the kind of journey that um, businesses and employers are on. And I'm not quite sure where that would be where that would be hosted but I am sure across the country for all of us that if we you know we've got um templates and and documents and information around different kind of profiles and things like that are being used that we could we could all share and that's going to make a, a stronger an absolutely stronger case that's the first bit but in relation to the training I think that um, I know, obviously, with the, you know, the Oliver McGowan training and the focus around, um, you know, improving awareness and, and, and some of the other research that's out there around getting much better paid employment outcomes and what some of the critical things are around improving awareness and I think acceptance around neurodiversity and neurodivergence. I think, I suppose, it, it's whether that's something that can come from the recommendations around maybe the autistica work you know i think you can almost see something that's that that that's a start anything is going to be better than nothing but I, I think something that's well crafted that you know employers can actually log in you know can actually access i think would be would be a really really good place to start definitely brilliant thanks fiona i think that segues quite nicely to you michelle doesn't it <laughs> thank you um so i'm just going to talk about um some of the work, and this is again the work we've been doing with UCL, um, and they have been um, conducting a series of internships and like employment readiness programs with a series of organisations. But they've actually got a new paper which has recently been accepted um, for publishing early next year, which actually looks about um, the impact of training. Um, and one of the really key findings from there is that training does have a place, but it needs to be a big part of a bigger program of work actually on its own it, it it has a small impact but not a significant impact so that's a really key thing is actually yes do the training but make sure you're building everything else around it it's just one key component that's handy and i always think that doing the training badly is far more help, harmful than having not done the training in the first place so i can see you nodding there yeah alex what are your thoughts very similar to that but just on the on the repository thing i think that from from working in large organizations, the the biggest pitfall is uh, it's very hard to keep that one place and you end up with about 20 different places you store things, right? So I think, and also it, it's hard to get the message all the way through. So what what we find to be really helpful in industry is um, just, you know, if you have a learning and development email that goes out on a quarterly basis, or you've got some kind of consistent comms, always have at the bottom a link to not just neurodiversity, but all DEI trainings and materials that you have, because I think what's often overlooked in the conversations is, is there is the intersectionality lens within neurodiversity itself, within, you know, being multiply divergent, but that experience comes into play more broadly in all DEI facets. So, so that and also then on the training bit, yeah, I think training is a very small facet. If you look at the DEI movement more broadly, if training was the magic bullet, 
we would have had a lot more progress in a lot of different areas because we've been doing trainings for a long time. And I think it is an important part. But if you look at the individuals that are doing it, we've got a million different trainings for a million different things. There is training fatigue. There is a certain level of, okay, but I don't have, my work doesn't stop. So how can we guarantee that the people sitting and doing the trainings are focused on the trainings and not also doing work in the background? And I think that's where the focus on shifting the culture to be more understanding, more broadly, to being compassionate, to supporting the individuals, that's where the focus needs to be placed more in and not just solely in the training. It does help, though. That's really helpful, Alex. Um, Michelle, is that a new hand or an old hand? Oh, that's an old hand. Sorry. <laughs> that's okay. Rebecca's got a new hand, though. Rebecca. Hi. Well, from the um, kind of central hub for um, this information, I know that there's um, there's a few different ones. I mean, obviously, we've got our employers guide and you know, neurodiversity and business pull together a few different um, bits of information information from different sources um yeah and I think as far as I know there's not one place that does this really um comprehensively um one of the things I mean we're seeing this across you know all of six of our goals you know there's just bits of information here and there research is happening it's not getting to the people that need to see it um so one of the things that we're developing and trying to develop as quickly as we can because we know there's a real need is um something called an online tips hub basically um well everyday tips hub is what we're calling it um just to pull that information together for whoever needs it um we know that families are crying out for the some information that is out there and does exist and um but they're just not hearing about it or they're coming across misinformation online so you know this this hub would be um a hub for autistic people and families but also for um employers and um, clinicians you know it'll be set at different levels um yeah it's going to be sort of quite a big resource and we'd um encourage people you know best practice um people writing blogs and things like that you know we're shaping what that looks like now working with um, autistic people and families specifically to understand their needs around this information and we'll be kind of widening that consultation out to employers as well um so that we can yeah really create this hub of information that's trusted and you know based on evidence because there's just a lot out there and some is evidence-based some is sort of opinion um so yeah that's in motion but doesn't exist yet <laughs> And it sounds amazing. So let us know if there's anything we can do to help with it. I also think it's really important that professionals and families see the same stuff and it is evidence-based because as my team will know, I'm a bit obsessed with things being evidence-based. I don't mind doing new things, but you know, if it's evidence-based, it might actually work. So um, that sounds like a really amazing resource. And I'm sure that everybody who's been on the call today would like to help if they can with that. That's really helpful. So we're almost ending our time now. So there's a couple of questions that I've got um which are uh one's quite techy really which is buckland review if you had a magic wand what would you like to see in the recommendations in it <laughs> who wants to go first rebecca shall i go because obviously <laughs> this is your thing <laughs> but yeah it. come on tell us um yeah. you know i guess we want we want to put the responsibility on um, organisations as the government do. I would like to see commitment from the government as well to try and incentivise organisations to do this stuff. I think, um, yeah, there's, I think it's going to take both sides really to make this happen because companies, you know, they get interested in neurodiversity one week and then they move on to something else. And I think to kind of ensure that there's real consistency and, and making sure that this links up with their recommendations link up with all the things that are happening around disability confidence and everything so i'd like to see sort of yeah a commitment from government um, around this stuff um given that the report is is kind of being being stamped by them but but equally you know i think this this theme that's coming through here around information sharing i think that that would be a really great um <laughs> uh, thing to come out of this so companies coming together in some sort of network of some kind um, and as I say, it's going to take someone to organise it, which is why, you know, I think some commitment from government would, would be useful. Um, but it's, uh, there's this nationwide sharing of information and best practice um, and that kind of real practical, like what people have done um, that's worked and hasn't worked as well, um, I think would be would be really useful output. 
That sounds amazing. Anyone else? No, was, so you summed that bit out there. So my very last bit is the bit about the productivity gap, to use my economic growth colleagues' language, which is and something that's perplexed ministers uh, of all governments over the last 25 years, which is compared to the population, the UK is less productive than some other countries. Not all, but some, um, as some of you will know. When you did the slides about the 0.9 to £1.3 million gap in potential, that comes out of not really developing your um, neurodiverse workforce, a lack of workforce progression and churning the workforce and people working part-time or full-time or in roles for which they are overskilled, which I think is sort of summarised back, if I got that right. So someone nodded me there. <laughs> but I think there's something here for me about just how we get the message across about the, the missed opportunity um, that you've got here. And... Also for me, the adult social care funding gap is 1.3 billion, right? So if you think about that, you could close the adult social care funding gap if you maximize um, and um, your um, neurodiverse workforce, which just sort of struck me when we were talking about it. So I've rumbled on for a bit there about productivity. Did anybody have any thoughts about what I said or did I get that completely wrong? <laughs> Okay, no one's saying completely wrong, but that's probably a really end of the session thought, isn't it, at that moment in time? Yep, okay, so that's a big thought to take away on this one. So I would like to thank, unless anybody else has anything else that they'd like us to cover or they'd like to say. No, silence. Right, so um, thank you very much to all our speakers who I think have been amazing and have brought real insight to this conversation. I think that's been brilliant. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for everybody who's participated. If we didn't answer your question or we've promised a link or a follow up, we will do that in the next few days, along with sending out the slides and various other bits and pieces. Um, and I hope that some of the people on this call will connect up again in the future on some other things, something else. <laughs>